For Crema Media's Polity, I'm Lumgil Ngomfe. Joining me are authors Greg Mills and Ray Hartley, here to discuss their book, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, Scenarios for South Africa's Uncertain Future. The book argues that we are likely to experience some form of coalition government in South Africa after the 2024 and 2029 general elections. Can you address the possible key outcomes and ramifications that may arise from this? Yeah, so all the surveys show that the ANC will not get 50% in the 2024 election. If they do, it would be a miracle at this stage. I mean, our own internal surveys that we've conducted show that their support is diminishing uh, compared to a year ago. So in that scenario, they would then choose, they would likely still be the biggest party. That's also not a certainty, but it's quite likely. And if they are, they would then have the first option to choose a coalition government. So the question is who would they choose? If they choose the EFF, then our view is that a series of outcomes would result which would be very bad for South Africa and for the economy. So populism, nationalizing uh, assets, a general very aggressive attitude towards business, uh, removing the independence of the Reserve Bank, um, stripping the Treasury of any kind of oversight role, and generally undermining institutions in the society, which is all in the EFF's program. It's there to read. Um, there's no, it's not being hidden. And the ANC already starts to display some of these populist tendencies. So that's a, that's a very bad outcome. If, however, they choose to go to the centre and form a coalition government, then there's the possibility of a, a not as bad outcome where they would at least have to moderate some of their approaches and would have to take into account and compromise and bring on board some of the other um, parties' views. There is, however, also the possibility that you would have an opposition coalition so if all of the opposition parties got together, they could form a government and have more than 50% of the vote, all depending on how it plays out and whether or not they're willing to be partners with each other. In that scenario, I think we potentially have an opportunity for renewal. It's a good scenario. Um, you could actually finally push ahead with all of these promised reforms and repairs to infrastructure uh, that have not happened under the ANC and start dealing with service delivery. So those are the broad sort of strokes uh, when it comes to coalitions. Can you briefly describe good, bad and ugly scenarios that South Africa may encounter in the future? Okay, so I think the, the good scenario for us is that there is some coalition of opposition uh, parties, maybe including some people from the ANC that uh, decide to go into the center and you have a strong centrist government that actually chooses to do the right thing with economic policy and start dealing with implementation and start drawing on the strengths of governments that have started to succeed such as those in the Western Cape and so on. Um, that scenario is unfortunately not the most likely, but it is possible. And then I think the bad scenario is where you have um, the EFF in a coalition with the ANC as we discussed just now, and you have this kind of slide to, to populism. And then the ugly scenario is really just dragging on with what we have now, which is the slow, steady decline and these slow, steady declines always tend to start accelerating. So failure to delivery, growing unhappiness amongst people um, with government, um, the ANC unable to implement reforms because they're large constituencies that it has to satisfy that are against those reforms, and the continuation of corruption and all of those problems. Why was it important to stress the need for economic reforms in South Africa? Well, because South Africa's economy has underperformed for at least half, slightly over half of the uh, post-apartheid period. Uh, we've had 30 years 
13 reasonable years, 17 pretty poor years of very low growth, of rising unemployment, of increasing debt, of dashed expectations, of declining governance, of failing infrastructure. Um, and unless you, you get the politics right, it's clear that you're not going to be able to get the economics right. There's a relationship between the two. Your political choices as voters will make an impact on your economic fortunes. It's as clear as daylight. And as Ray has described, if we have a situation where we have a, a doubling down on the more populist radical elements promising more redistribution from a shrinking cake, then we're likely to suffer the economic consequences, which will in in invariably be short-term redistribution followed by dramatic uh, economic collapse from which it will take a very long time, if ever, to recover. If you have more of a centrist political formation emerging out of this, with a strong sense of implementation of delivery, where it really feels the connection with the population, it doesn't rely on identity, but rather relies on issues and of its record uh, to, to win its political support, then I think you've got a different future staring uh, at South Africa. It's a future where we can realize people's potential, where we can focus on delivery on key long-term things like education. You need at least a generation to solve the education crisis in South Africa. You need a very long time to turn our infrastructure around, and this has been reminded by the electricity and roads and now growing water crisis in the country. And you need a very long time to rebuild faith in institutions and in policies which allow for people like you and me to invest our savings in the country rather than invest them somewhere else. And that leads to long-term growth and long-term uh, employment creation. So if we, if we reset our politics left of center into more populist terrain, I don't think we're going to have the long-term economic future that we, most of us at least, crave for. Uh, if we reset our politics towards the centre, uh, which is based on delivery and a record of delivery rather than a record of history uh, of a political sort, uh, then I think there's, there's opportunity. And that's essentially what the good, bad and the ugly says. It draws from a range of international experiences in so doing. Um, it says where countries have followed this redistributive path, things haven't gone well, but where they've gone the more centrist path, they've done better. There's some examples in between. Uh, Brazil probably falls into the fistful of, of dollars or fistful of cents scenario. It's not the good, bad, ugly of the sort of Western genre. It's, uh, it's more of pockets of, of prosperity in amongst wider areas of poverty. Uh, and that's to an extent what we have in South Africa today. But it's perhaps more amplified in Brazil uh, than it is in South Africa. Uh, and the, the ugly scenario which, which Ray has indicated is really where we are today, but it just drags on and probably starts accelerating because you reach a tipping point in your infrastructure where suddenly it becomes very difficult to keep it going if you fail to make investments. And I think that's one of the lessons of South Africa for the last 30 years. We inherited a, an infrastructure back in 1994, it was kept alive, very little improvement. We ran down the amount that the public sector, the government invested in, in infrastructure, and now we're suffering the consequences. So we have to ramp up that expenditure and ramp up the skills that are necessary to run it to be able to enjoy the good type scenario that we hope for. But that has a political foundation, and this book is really about the political foundation. What are the key challenges bedeviling economic growth in South Africa, and does the ruling party have the political will and ability to resolve this? I think the key challenge is, is politics. Um, the key challenge is we, we don't deliver on what we promise. We lack the implementation capabilities. A key problem is the absence of institutions which could actually carry out the ambitious plans of government. 
in part because of the way in which government has staffed these institutions and the way in which it's held them accountable. Um, a key problem is that we've largely taken an apartheid economy and essentially continued with it with some modifications, but not expanded and made it more inclusive, which has enabled a different economy to emerge. So we've dealt with poverty largely by redistributing through grants, which we agree uh, is absolutely necessary, but it's also absolutely necessary to get people to graduate off that. And the way in which you get people to graduate off that is by growing your economy, providing opportunities and providing skills levels which enable them to become full participants in the economy. And perhaps the thing we've failed the most at is in fact that, uh, is education. Um, it's probably been the, the, the gravest, most chronic failure over the last 30 years. South Africa spends proportionately more money on education than any other country, and yet our results are, are tragically poor. Um, matriculants uh, barely scrape past uh, many of them the exams, uh, the pass rates are very, very low. Um, if you include all of those who've fallen out, they're barely over 50%. Um, and the actual pass mark, particularly in subjects that really matter, like maths and science, uh, is very, very low indeed. So, so we're, we're not developing the next generation of skills. The incentive structures to do so just simply don't exist. And we've got to change those incentive structures for teachers, for parents, for pupils, uh, and then all the way up in that process. This can't afford, the history of apartheid is you can't afford an elite-based economy. It's not a recipe for long-term stability and prosperity. You need to have an inclusive uh, and less extractive political and social mindset that goes with our economic policies and our developmental policies. Why does a competitive political system serve as an essential catalyst for social and economic mobility? Yeah, I mean, I think political competition is the essence of democracy. So over the last three decades, we've had insufficient political competition. We've had a very dominant party that has won elections and has, you know, the election results have got worse and worse, but they still have been the majority for all of the post-apartheid elections. And the result has been that they have become complacent and feel entitled to be in power and have failed to deliver. They don't feel the heat. You know, when you have political competition, it's a sense that, you know, if we don't perform, we're going to get voted out and these guys are going to come in and take over. So we better get our act together and deliver and do these things. And when you have been in power for so long and been dominant for so long, you lose that edge. And I think it's starting to come back. I think the opposition is starting to get together and talk about coalitions and working together. Um, and that is starting to inject some political competition into the system. And you know, the question really is whether the ANC can actually do anything, because it does feel the heat a bit now, but it struggles because the machinery that you need in the state to do all of these things has been degraded so badly. So the CADA deployments, which the Zondo Commission went into, great detail about the problem that you have, you know, that results from replacing technically competent people with incompetent party loyalists is that you, your service delivery just starts to degrade and collapse. So can they actually turn it around? It's very, very difficult to do that. You argue that populism subverts economic growth and development. How should South Africa avoid a populist future? You know, what we really have to avoid at all costs is abandoning the um, institutions of accountability in, this, in the state. So at the moment we have a judiciary which has taken a stand in several instances to you know, halt state capture and to expose it. Uh, we had a public protector who did the same thing and she was then replaced by someone who was uh, you know, totally incompetent. So we've lost that institution. 
So what happens under populism is that those institutions start to get hollowed out because they stand in the way of holding on to power. So an independent uh, reserve bank is vital because there needs to be certainty amongst investors that there won't be political changes to the way that we manage our finances um, and our currency. Um, there are a lot of populist challenges to that. The Reserve Bank must be nationalized. It, you know, the, it must be brought into the fold and like everything else must be made into part of the political system and not an independent institution that mediates from the outside. So those are the dangers. I mean, the populist route, as some of the illustrations in the book show, I mean, you know, it leads to Venezuela. It leads to really a collapse of government, um, failed state, mass immigration of the population, and uh, very low investment and, and, and a rapid decline in people's living circumstances. What are the main structural problems in politics? And how should political leaders respond to this? Now, I think one of the key structural problems in our politics is that we have a very fractured opposition. So, you know, if the opposition can get together, then you, you have a politically competitive system. At the moment, the opposition is sort of fractured amongst, there is the DA, which is by far and away the largest individual party. Um, and then you have a whole lot of other smaller parties and they're all they all desperately hold on to their existence because everybody wants to be a leader and so on which is understandable but they could get together and form a more powerful force because I think that our political system is predicated on a competitive elections and you know that's the engine that makes democracy work so that's a quite a big structural problem. And then I think the second one is the, the way in which the last 30 years have reshaped the institutions of government and really hollowed out the skills and so on. So there's a structural problem because for the ANC to fix that, it has to make itself unpopular with a lot of civil servants that are loyal to it, that it has appointed and put in positions where they are unable to execute their duties. So if it were to clean the civil service out of those people, it would affect its political uh, standing. So that's a structural obstacle to the ANC doing anything. It explains why they don't deal with the civil service and don't deal with incompetence and don't fix the state-owned enterprises because they have large constituencies of people that are deployed there that are their people that they would have to act against to sort those institutions out. That's a major structural obstacle to moving forward. And it's less structural, but perhaps it's no less important in that the elephant in the room, of course, in South Africa is identity. And identity still matters. If you look at voting patterns across the country, um, if you look at voting patterns in the Western Cape, for example, it's illustrative that identity matters in South African politics. And that means that our past matters in some ways more than in other circumstances, in part because our past was recently, was relatively recent, but also because our past was so painful in many respects. So race is still a very important feature of our political structures. Um, and it's used by politicians to their advantage, sometimes less cynically than by others. But one is going to, at some point, have to break out of that paradigm, out of that reality, as it were, to be able to build a different South Africa where it matters less. And I think that the ANC, its failure to deliver, means that race matters as much today to the ANC as it perhaps mattered, if not more, than it mattered back in 1994. And it's very important that... that uh, uh, the South African public uh, mature also to be able to realize that uh, it has other options which are outside of these these racial boundaries that we've that we, we're so familiar with in South Africa. So I think that's a, another structural reality but also in some respects impediment to the way in which our politics functions. It, it, it makes it very hard to have a, 
a contest of ideas and issues over uh, questions of identity. That was Greg Mills and Ray Hartley discussing their book, The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, Scenarios for South Africa's Uncertain Future.